So today I'm interviewing Dr. Rosemary Gray. Um, today is December 11th, 2017. And so we'll just start the interview with a bit about your um, biographical information mm -hmm. in the beginning. So when were you born? I was born on January 29th, 1945. My mother was alone with her mother because my father was a World War II bombardier navigator mm -hmm. who served in the Pacific. So he did not see me until I was about six weeks old okay. when he had to leave from the service. Mm -hmm. And where were you born? In uh, Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. which is, of course, famous for the lead in the water. Yeah. And um, Flint, uh, when I was born, was a more thriving city. General Motors had um, multiple factories there, but now it's uh, one of the dying towns of the north. Mm -hmm. And um, when I go back for high school reunions, I believe that I'm the only one from my high school class that ever got a PhD degree. Mm. It was very um, unusual from the setting that I came from. That makes some sense, just mm -hmm. a pre an industrial town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you know what you wanted to do before you um, were applying to colleges? Um, not really. I. Um, when I w went to college, we're kind of jumping ahead, I would mm -hmm. uh, try different majors. At one point I thought I wanted to be uh, like an elementary education teacher, but I took like a couple of, or at least one of those elementary ed classes and ended up with about two sentences of notes for the whole semester and thought I'm not learning much here. Mm -hmm. So I um, switched, I think I was an English major for a while. and ended up in psychology kind of mm -hmm. probably when I was a junior. Okay, so we'll back up a little bit mm -hmm. um, to um, mm -hmm. what colleges you applied to. Um, well, I, uh, at that point, I thought I wanted to live um, far from home and be uh, independent. And so I ended up at St. Louis University, which was about over 500 miles from Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. and ended up being homesick mm -hmm. all four years. So uh, when my parents dropped me off, they uh, we went to the St. Louis airport and they bought me a round trip ticket for Thanksgiving. And so I kept that on my dresser the whole semester mm -hmm. and because I knew I was gonna go home eventually. Mm -hmm. But even after four years, the homesickness never really left. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would make some sense. You were just eager to be back and at home for that. Mm -hmm. So when you um, you graduated with a degree in psychology, mm -hmm. is yes. which you would um, joined when you were in a junior year. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me about leaving. Um, tell me about getting your psychology degree. Okay, um, I was in the um, honors program when I was a, an undergraduate student. And this becomes important later because it involved a tremendous amount of writing. Um, one semester I had to write 26 papers. Um, and so I got used to doing the research and we didn't have computers. So I had to go to the library and read. I'd write the paper and then type it on my typewriter, turn it in and start over again. It was two papers a week basically. Wow. And then. Um, but during my college years, it was during the initial civil rights movement um, with Martin Luther King Jr. and the um, Selma, Alabama, the first desegregation. And so um, St. Louis was, I'd say, partially segregated. It wasn't as bad as further south, mm -hmm. but there were still um, the civil rights marches and candlelight vigils. And I was very much um, involved in those activities. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and John Kennedy was assassinated when I was a sophomore in, um, in college. And so, um, when I learned about different types of um, psychotherapy, the main therapy at that time was psychoanalysis or psychodynamic therapy. Mm -hmm. And um, from reading about it, 
um, it seemed to me people needed like years of analysis and they would go three times a week and be on somebody's couch. So I talked to my advisor and I said, this seems very elitist and in the midst of the civil rights movement, I was thinking, is there any kind of therapy that would be more convenient for more people? Mm -hmm. And so my advisor told me that there was a new type of therapy called behavior therapy that typically worked in 12 to 16 sessions and people could, um, learn, could come and um, learn the techniques of behavior therapy and feel better in terms of anxiety, depression, whatever. So of course I said, well I'm ready to go to graduate school, so where can I learn about behavior therapy? And she said, well the only place I know it's so new is in um, London, England. Mm. And so I said, um, well that's great, but how can I ever go to London? And at that time, in the, um, uh, this would have been in the late 1960s, People really didn't travel the way they do now mm -hmm. to my family had never been abroad and neither had I. So she said, well, you have the credentials to uh, be awarded a Fulbright scholarship. And what I would suggest is that you write to um, the professor that's in charge of the behavior therapy in London, his, uh, Professor Hans Eysenck, who is now deceased, and write to him. and." Um, tell him that you'd like to study there and would he write an endorsement if you got the funds to go there. Mm -hmm. So I got um, a very short letter, of course it came by uh, email, not email, but airport mail. Mm -hmm. They had a special uh, type of stationery for um, air mail. Sure. And it just said that uh, it's this is his, I have the original too, but this is his um, Hans Eysenck's um, signature. And it just said, if you uh, are successful in obtaining your scholarship and want to study with us for a year, we'd be very happy to have you with us. Mm -hmm. So it was um, relatively easy for the Fulbright Commission. I had the credentials and I had the letter, so all they had to do was plug in the money mm -hmm. for me to go to, um, to London. Mm -hmm. And then I did two kinds of things in London. It was learning about behavior therapy, mm -hmm. Uh, and then, uh, then also did some research in um, Professor Isink's uh, laboratory. He has a um, uh, personality theory that he was um, carrying out experiments about. Mm -hmm. And then I also met stu uh, the, most of the students were for international students, mm -hmm. and so um, I got to meet students from um, other parts of the world. And actually through them, I learned about where I ended up going to graduate school. It was um, It was then called the State University of New York at Stony Brook, mm -hmm. SUNY Stony Brook. And I think recently they changed, shortened it to Stony Brook University okay. because the SUNY system has multiple sites in it. Sure. And so um, when I was in England, and again, this is all pre-computer days, and certainly pre-cell phone days, um, I um, applied to Stony Brook and um, actually got a telegram of acceptance back that I was uh, accepted into their program. So that's how I ended up, and, be and the reason I chose Stony Brook was because they were one of the a uh, couple of places in the U.S. that were also starting behavior therapy programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I was really kind of in on the ground floor, so to speak, mm -hmm. in the behavior therapy movement. Right, yeah. And then you had the um, experience of being in London studying there as well, and you could take that to Stony Brook. Right, exactly. Wow. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then so you um, then moved to New York for the Stony Brook? Yes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. yes, it's on Long Island. It's about 60 miles out on Long Island from mm -hmm. Uh, New York City, mm -hmm. so it was a lovely area, and I was in the second class at Stony Brook, and uh, I know we talk about diversity now, but back then it was gender diversity, so the clinical faculty were all male, and I was the only female. My class, my doctoral class, had nine students oh. in it, and I was the only female, but I was 
truthfully just used to it because in college I took like calculus one, calculus two, you know, physics classes and there were there weren't any other females in those classes and I just thought, well, that's the way it is mm -hmm. and so it wasn't really like feeling I was singled out mm -hmm. in any any way. And um, graduate school was very um, chaotic because it was during the Vietnam War when uh, college students were being drafted left and right. Mm -hmm. And so um, Stony Brook was actually in Time Magazine as one of the hotbeds mm -hmm. of student protests. And so there was police presence on campus mm -hmm. virtually all of the time. And I had an old article from Stony Brook that uh, showed the uh, a confrontation between a group of students and a group of police officers. Yeah, it looks really intense. And the uh, police cars would be set on, overturned and set on fire. Um, and my point of saying all this is I don't really, uh, it was very hard to get an education because you could even going from a parking lot to an academic building, you were like stepping through uh, police cars and protest lines mm -hmm. and um, I never had a graduation because we weren't allowed to have uh, gatherings of people oh. because there were bomb threats and buildings were shut down by student protesters and mm -hmm. so it affects me even today because I didn't buy academic regalia because we didn't have a ceremony. I got a hood in the mail and I got a, my diploma in the mail but uh, I still have to wear our borrowed regalia because I didn't ever uh, need it for my own um, graduation. Plus, it was the very early days of behavior therapy, so there were only two journals that started that um, were publishing articles in behavior therapy, and there were some books that were like anthologies of case studies, mm -hmm. but when I talked to my peers who were in my class, I basically say, well, what did we do? We didn't have anything to read. And they joke back and said, that's because we were doing the pioneer work, mm -hmm. doing the experiments, and doing case studies ourselves. So that you and um, the Stony Brook had a psychology clinic, and that's where we did our practicum. It was a community clinic similar to what the UNCG clinic is. Mm -hmm. And we did our practicum there, and we had labs at the building. But again, it was just challenging because right. of um, all the chaos on campus at that time. Yeah, that's got to be a lot with you being on the front of the field, but also <laughs> yes. like just a very intense hotbed of a campus. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but then you graduate in what year? Um, well, I actually took this job. I had finished running my dissertation data, but I didn't actually finish my dissertation. So. I knew I wanted an academic job, and then I went to three places, UNCG being the third place. Mm -hmm. And so the first place I went was Dartmouth, and the plane left LaGuardia, and all of a sudden the pilot said, it's snowing so hard, there are no airports open, so we're landing at the very next airport. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, 60 miles away from Dartmouth where I was supposed to give my job talk. So they put us up in a motel, hotel, and then uh, my job talk was actually delayed 24 hours mm -hmm. because they had to put me in a cab um, when the snow stopped to go from this hotel to um, Dartmouth. And wow. my thoughts were, if I ever get out of here, I am never coming back <laughs> because it was uh, so. I mean, things went well at Dartmouth, but they also just had a master's program. And then I went to a Big Ten university, and I won't name it. Uh, it was again an all male faculty, and they were extremely rude when I was giving my job talk. Oh, no. Back then, we had didn't have you know PowerPoints and so on, so I had a blackboard and chalk, and right in the middle of when I was writing things, I could hear them like laughing in the background. So I just put the chalk down and I said, um, just looked up then and said, uh, I'm ready to talk when you're ready to listen, and I just stood there. And then uh, on the way back to the airport, the department had said, 
well, we're going to have our faculty meeting on Friday or whatever, and we'll let you know if you got the job or not. And I said, well, if I'm your only agenda item, you can cancel the meeting because your colleagues are so rude, I would never work here. Mm. And that was the end of that. And then my third uh, interview was here at UNCG, and it was a difference of night and day. Really? I mean, it was, it, it was mm. still an all-male faculty, but the people uh, were as nice as could be, and they, could, they were just bending over backward in terms of you know, what do you want to see, what do you want to learn about, um, just uh, as nice as anything, and just were very welcoming during my job talk. And so I was hired. Uh, and gladly took the position at UNCG, but because I hadn't had my oral defense, I was hired in 1971 as an instructor, mm -hmm. and then I finished my dissertation during that year. I went back to Stony Brook to defend my dissertation, and then, so the next year, 1972, I was an, um, an assistant professor and oh, had okay. a contract as an assistant professor. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. so there's just like a transfer of a little gray area. Right, exactly. Gotcha. Wow. I was working on that my dissertation. Mm -hmm. So what was the Board of Psychology like when you started the Department of Psychology? Here at UNCG? Yes. Um, well, it was a, a male faculty, and the, uh, but Bob Eason, who was one of the department heads at that time, was extremely open-minded, and so um, he hired three females, including me, in that same year, 1971. So, um, and then Jackie White, who stayed, she just retired a couple years ago. She was here for the long haul, and then Marilyn Erickson left after just a few years um, here. And so, um, the other thing that Bob Deason did that was very good, he uh, was very open-minded and used something what people now call holistic admissions okay. and admitted quite a few diverse students that were uh, probably didn't have the same type of credentials but he could see the promise and the opportunity and so um, uh, the most famous of them was uh, Norm Anderson, who became CEO of the American Psychological Association oh, okay. in Washington, D.C. And Norm Anderson came back last summer mm -hmm. to visit, and he and I went to see Bob Eason, who's now living at the friend's home. He's 92. And we went to visit him and took some pictures um, with him this summer. And uh, maybe five or eight years ago, there was um, a colloquium or a symposium, I guess, in Bob's honor, and the minority students all came back and gave talks about him and talks about their own work in his honor because it was very um, uh, memorable that he had done that. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the UNCG uh, Board of Governors had just authorized UNCG to offer a doctoral program in psychology in 1970. Oh, wow. So that was why these um, open positions were given to the psychology department. And there really wasn't, there was nothing like a clinical program. And Bob Eason talked about having what he called an applied wing of the experimental program. So, <coughs> excuse me, so the, um, so two of the three hires that year were in uh, applied, the, be the behavior therapy. And there was already Scott Lawrence, who had been here, and he had um, just retired a couple years ago from UNCG. So we formed like the core of this applied wing mm -hmm. of the, um, the program, and then it developed later into a clinical program. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And where were you housed? Um, the psychology department, uh, when I got here, the whole campus, of course, has changed. Right. The um, psychology department was the third and fourth floors of the nursing building, the current nursing building. Okay. And then um, down on Market Street, where the currently the uh, School of Music, the new building, is housed, there were old houses and the animal research back then, you probably heard about like um, using rats and pigeons to do basic learning studies sure. and teaching rats to run mazes or pigeons to pack keys for reinforcement. 
So those animal studies were in the old houses on Market Street where the School of Music is. And then the first psychology clinic, because you can't have a, a clinical program without a practicum facility, mm -hmm. was in an old house across the street from the nursing building. And those houses um, were torn down and replaced with a parking lot. And that was great because you could also buy a reserve parking space, uh. which yours truly had one. <laughs> and then the parking lot was then replaced by the Sullivan Science Building. So mm -hmm. that's what's standing there right now. And then in 1977, um, I was um, on the faculty and worked with Bob Eason in designing this building. Mm -hmm. And the most notable thing, everything was, of course, put together here. The animal labs were on the sixth floor, and then the clinic was on this floor, and it has since moved to third floor. Uh, West Market Street. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but also, uh, we decided to have all of the faculty offices, regardless of the area of psychology, so like social psychology, uh, cognitive psychology, um, developmental psychology, clinical psychology, all of us have offices that are on the second floor. Mm -hmm. So it makes for a lot of collegiality. The gotcha. offices are small because we had limited floor space, mm -hmm. but purposefully we d wanted everybody to be together mm -hmm. so people could collaborate or mm -hmm. you know just have more collegial relations. Yeah. So that was... Uh, uh, a big move for the psychology department and now I believe Eberhardt is the oldest building on campus that has not been renovated. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, we get a, a coat of paint every <laughs> once in a while, that's about it. Gotcha. Uh, um, and then what were some of your favorite classes to teach? Um, well, when I was um, a junior faculty member I taught large classes. I taught primarily abnormal psychology and we had these 500 level classes which were called service classes so teachers had to have continuing education classes or other departments um, required 500 level classes for their own master's degrees or whatever so those were typically uh, could be anywhere from 60 to 100 students and uh, now, because uh, that was back in the um, 70s and 80s primarily, I run into those individuals that were former students of mine who are now doing all kinds of wonderful things themselves. And so just as an example, mm -hmm. um, Celia Hooper, who is the dean of um, the college, or I guess the College of Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. um, this was, she's now stepping down as dean, and she asked me to be in this photo of her because she was a student in one of my 500 level classes and um, remembers that. Oh. And then uh, one of the practicum placements where I work now is a newcomer school, which I'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. And at Newcomer School, the uh, school counselor is, uh, was also a student of mine, and um, the Newcomer students are immigrant and refugee children, and she introduces me to them as her teacher, and they it just doesn't comprehend how could, how could you, mm -hmm. who is our school counselor, have a teacher. So it's um, fun to meet the other um, the students that mm -hmm. I taught in the past and see them flourishing in their own professions, of course. And then um, as time went on, um, the I became, I guess, more specialized in my teaching. So I teach um, a graduate class every semester. And then I also, uh, for teaching credit, supervised in the UNCG Psychology Clinic or in other off-campus practicum settings. And so I, um, my main contact with undergraduates now is um, I have a, a large lab, a research lab, and I have at any one time about five graduate students and anywhere between five and ten undergraduate students. And we all meet together once a week and the undergraduates, um, some are doing their own honors theses in the lab and others are just helping run participants in the lab. Okay. But I'm not directly teaching an undergraduate class and I haven't for 
of maybe the last decade. Right, but it's a different kind of teaching atmosphere yes. in terms of just like helping them with their research exactly. and running the clinic. It's much more one-on-one -on -one teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So what changes did you notice under the Department of Psychology during your time here? Okay, well the, um, of course the change from, as we just talked about, moving from the sort of scattered site to the Eberhardt Building in 1977, and of course we're still in the Eberhardt Building, so that was a change. Yeah. There was, um, people have always been very, the faculty have always been very kind, I think, to each other. Um, but there were the main, I guess, controversial discussions we had outside consultants come was like how many areas within psychology could we afford to um, have represented in the psychology department. Okay. So initially there were six different areas and now there are four areas and I think that's here to stay. It mm -hmm. seems pretty um, stable. So we have um, clinical, social, developmental, and cognitive, mm -hmm. and the two areas that were uh, sort of naturally attrition was um, the learning theory or, or the strict behavioral principles, and then also um, physiological psychology. The animal research stopped, and mm -hmm. the um, because um, physiological psychology kind of morphed into neurosciences, and it's um, the equipment's very expensive, mm -hmm. and um, there's a big stretch between the behavior of the brain and the behavior of the person. Mm -hmm. So we are not doing um, the neurosciences research here. Okay. So that was a change, and then um, faculty, of course, have come and gone. Um, and it's, uh, we did continue to hire uh, female faculty, and it's interesting to me that the only one who got tenure who already came with children was um, Susan Keene, who's still here, as of course is a full professor. She's uh, next in seniority to me mm -hmm. um, in the department. Um, and it wasn't uh, only because people had children, there were many single females and single males or males with children also didn't get tenure, but mm -hmm. that's um, you know, just uh, most people instead of going through the tenure process knew ahead of time or were uh, instructed ahead of time you're unlikely to get tenure so they left um, mm -hmm. you know with some dignity instead of going through that whole process sure so that was some um, changes and we um, recently hired uh, an African-American male who's director of the UNCG Psychology Clinic, and we're uh, desperately trying to hire an African-American faculty member, at least within the clinical area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna shift over to when you were director of cl uh, clinical training. Mm -hmm. So that was 77 is when I have it. Does that right. sound right to you, yeah? Um, yes. Well, there, there's history to that, too. So when I first came in 1971, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, Bob Eason talked about having an applied wing, is what he called, of the experimental program. And again, behavior therapy fits with that because we, could, we do our own experiments. The treatments that we use are empirically validated treatments compared to um, doing nothing or doing other kinds of treatments. So, um, but there was a reluctance, I'd say, to call it a clinical program. Okay. And then during those first few years I was here, I knew that in order for our students to eventually get licensed and either practice or become faculty members or work for an agency as a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, they had to get licensed. And the only way, the easiest way to get licensed is to get come from an APA approved program. APA is the American Psychological Association. So come from an APA approved program, do an APA approved internship, and then the, each state has a licensing board and then but that's kind of a ticket that you've had a good education. Mm -hmm. Then you still have to take a national exam. Um, it's called the EPPP. It's an exam for practicing psychologists. Um, that's a national exam. And then each state has their own exam as well. So 
um, I convinced um, Bob Eason that we should go for APA accreditation. And um, so we hired uh, Peter Nathan as a consultant, and he is a um, famous person, I guess, in, um, from Rutgers University, I think he was the dean, and uh, a clinical psychologist himself, and he came as a paid consultant to say what he thought we needed to do. And that was in 1977 as well. This mm -hmm. building was new then. Mm -hmm. And so um, among the suggestions he had was um, you have to name this as a doctoral program in clinical psychology, and you have to name somebody as the director of clinical training. Mm -hmm. So even though I had been sort of functioning that way, um, just informally, mm -hmm. uh, then so then I got that title of director of clinical training mm -hmm. in 1977, and then uh, the, the APA accreditation process is extremely uh, tedious because there's all these forms to fill out, mm -hmm. and you have to keep all these records. And again, we didn't have computers. This was in 1977. And so the forms all had to be filled out either by typewriter or by hand. Mm -hmm. And then uh, everything had to be mailed to Washington where the headquarters for APA. So um, we did that. And then uh, the typical procedure after you do the paperwork is three site visitors come and they interview the faculty and they interview the students and look at the facilities and so on. And so the site visit occurred in the 1981-82 academic year. And that was, we um, won our first accreditation mm -hmm. at that period of time. Wow. And then the time length between site visits has changed by APA rules. Mm -hmm. And so the most you can get now is a seven-year approval mm -hmm. before another site visit. So we're in sort of the middle of a seven-year cycle. Okay. And then I um, was director of clinical training for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And then Arthur Anastopoulos was for either two or three years. And then Susan Keene has been director of clinical training mm -hmm. for uh, ever since that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh -huh. she, and remains that way. So you were involved with like helping to get the accreditation yes, from the American definitely. Psychological, but mm -hmm. doing with the paperwork and yes. all the yes. accreditation yes. handbook and paperwork and everything. Yes. yes. <laughs> it was, sounded tedious. Yes, um, it was. <laughs> and then to maintain accreditation, there's an annual report due every year, and there's all of these data, the statistics that you have to keep, and mm -hmm. you know every single student, like who was, how many applicants did you have, and how many were made offers, how many accepted those offers. You know, did anybody leave the program before they got their degree? When they got their degree, you know, who chaired their dissertation? What do they do for their internship? What do they do for their first job? Mm -hmm. So. Did they get licensed or not. I mean, you have to keep track of these people basically the rest of their lives. Yeah, it sounds that <laughs> yeah. way. Mm -hmm. So what changes did you implement during your time as director of clinical training? Um, probably the main thing, uh, we had what were called in-house or captive internships, and they were like Forsyth County Mental Health Center, Davidson County Mental Health Center, Guilford County Mental Health Center, and we, uh, our students were placed in those sites, and then our own faculty went to those sites to do um, on-site supervision. And um, so, but APA uh, accredited us with that idea that we had these kind of in-house internships, but it was harder and harder for students to get licensed having to explain that you know, we the site visitors would actually drive out with me or someone else to these um, sites, which were 30 miles away or whatever. So we switched to requiring the APA-approved internships, which there's hundreds of them, and they're all over the country. Mm -hmm. And students apply to those. Usually, the deadline is November 1st, mm -hmm. and right now, during December and January, they have interviews, and then they're matched much the way like. Um, Doc, uh, MDs, medical mm -hmm. residents, are matched to a site, mm -hmm. um, and they learn that in February, and then the internship lasts one year, and we're not allowed to award 
um, doctoral degrees until they finish the program and their dissertation and their internship. Oh, okay. And only then, and so the typical time is about, it's either be somewhere between six and seven years mm -hmm. from the beginning of the doctoral program to the actual degree. Okay. And what were those site visits like when you were, because then you had to go all over the place, right? Well, we had site visitors come here, okay. but in the, my early career here, um, it, I was um, very active both nationally and internationally uh, for, let's say, about maybe 20 years, 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so I became a site visitor myself. Mm -hmm. And um, the American Psychological Association, the accreditation office, would particularly invite me to go to like problem programs because they would say, you know the standards, but you can also um, present the feedback in a way that uh, is not uh, damaging to the people that are there. Mm -hmm. So I did just multiple site visits myself um, and eventually became a consultant like Peter Nathan was to this program. Mm -hmm. So I knew that accreditation process kind of inside and out, sure. a recipient and a deliverer in the process. Right. And then uh, during that time I was also on a lot of um, professional organizations that required travel. I was uh, going to Washington quite a bit for um, the American Psychological Association, the Council of Representatives, those kind of meetings. Mm -hmm. I was active in uh, AABT, the Association for Advancement of Behavior Therapy, and would go to their board meetings and conventions. Um, the, there's uh, all the directors of clinical training, there's about uh, under 200, but there's about 200, uh, both in the United States and Canada. They. Um, I was eventually elected the uh, chair of that council of okay. clinical directors, but they had annual meetings, they still do, mm -hmm. where the directors talk to each other and learn different, um, what, what's going on in other programs mm -hmm. and how to deal with certain issues that come up across programs. Um, and so I was traveling probably once or twice a month, and then I was also invited to multiple other countries to give talks about my research and behavioral assessment. Mm -hmm. And so I was in um, South America, in uh, Peru, in Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico City, and then also went to invited trips to um, Asia. I gave a presentation in Hong Kong and in Singapore and Thailand. Um, and so and I went to Australia and uh, gave a presentation in the city of Adelaide in Australia and visited some other cities there. And so um, I didn't get married until late in life. Um, I was, I think, 40, 40-ish 40 when I got married. And then um, my husband and I had two sons right away, and then it was just the traveling was just too much. Mm -hmm. I tried one trip with one, had leaving one child at home, and by the time I packed all of the bags, this is for Monday, this is for Tuesday, and get him to daycare and don't do this, and I thought this just is not worth it. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of resigned from all of that travel and all of the boards. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, just ended up staying home happily and working at UNCG happily and leaving the rest kind of behind me at sure. that time. Well, you did do a lot of traveling. I did. So I you did. Got, got a good amount in before yes. focus, re, um, focusing a bit further on, yes, on things. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yes. So I think we're going to shift to professional development and growth. Okay. So tell me about, so you arrived here as an instructor first. Right, because I had to finish my dissertation mm -hmm. that first year. Mm -hmm. And then I went through the ranks at now I can see uh, at an exceptionally fast pace but I was um, just 
doing it, and so I didn't even think about it that way. So I was an assistant professor for only three years, and then was promoted to associate professor with tenure, and I was only an associate professor for four years, and then was promoted to full professor. And it was um, in part because I had a very heavy publication record mm -hmm. right away, mm -hmm. and um, I attribute that to the uh, that when I was at St. Louis University, having to write twenty six papers in one semester. Sure, I it, it was uh, again we still didn't have computers, but as fast as I could move the pencil on the page, or we did have typewriters, as fast as I could type, the words luckily just kind of came out, mm -hmm. and I always had graduate students to help collect data in the lab, and that part, so I had a good pr uh, publication record. Mm -hmm. um, it was much harder to analyze data then. Um, we didn't have um, computers in-house. There was a was called a mainframe, a big computer, very big. It took a, like a room mm -hmm. in Forney building, and you had to um, key punch cards, computer cards that were shaped like a rectangle, mm -hmm. and then the cards had to be in a certain order. So if it be like group one, condition A, and if you ever dropped a box of cards, it was virtually impossible to, you'd have to start over again, because everything had to be in a certain order, mm -hmm. and you'd have to carry this box of cards to the mainframe and put, wait your turn and put them in the computer, and then the, you would get a data output, a paper data output, mm -hmm. wow. and then have to write your manuscripts based on the paper output. So, um, but because I had uh, a strong publication record, I was, um, you know, promoted very quickly. And then also because I was um, promoted uh, quickly and had so many publications, and I was awarded, this was in, again, an academic year, 1989 to 1990. This is the uh, UNCG um, Research Excellence Award, oh, wow. which I got, and now you can wear it on ceremonial um, occasions, like at graduation over mm -hmm. regalia and so on, so it so was a... So um, were you nominated for that? And um, then yes, yes. Uh -huh, by yeah. the faculty? Yes, uh -huh, by, I think, uh, by this one would have been from our department, mm -hmm. but it's a university-wide award. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not just the College of Arts and Sciences, mm -hmm. and, and it's still, there's one winner a year mm -hmm. of the award. It's a, it's a huge honor is yes, what I'm getting yeah, to. <laughs> yes, it yes. really is. Yeah, so I want to shift back to your research public um, uh -huh. productivity because uh -huh. you have the notes where I have for you is uh, how many I think we need to get in that you have 157 peer reviewed journal articles. Those are journal articles, and yes. Four and four books. And I have four books, and, um, and then I didn't count like published book reviews mm -hmm. or book chapters, right. which are on top of that. But um, I also had. Uh, the only colleague I've published a lot with was mm -hmm. um, Steve Hayes, who was on our faculty, and I believe he left in 1986, and he, um, he and I have about 15 publications together. Mm -hmm. Typically, I publish more with my graduate students than with other faculty. I have a smattering with other faculty, but it's usually my graduate students and Steve was Steve Hayes was the exception where he and I published quite a bit together. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so what were you? Uh, what are your four books on? Um, well, they were in the behavioral assessment arena, okay. and one book was had a first and second edition, and Steve Hayes and David Barlow, who was um, Steve Hayes' internship mentor. Um, we each wrote chapters, different chapters in the book. It was called the Scientist Practitioner Model, so how you integrate research and clinical practice. And that had two editions that was sold pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then um, Steve Hayes and I edited a book called The Conceptual Foundations of Behavioral Assessment. And uh, truthfully, it was harder to edit a book because uh, we would tell the different authors, this is kind of what we want as a content, 
um, and then they would write the chapter and it would be not what we wanted and you'd give them feedback and then they would still go back to their old ways and write what they want to write. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it was it would have been easier to write the book ourselves. And then my fourth book was with a graduate student, one of my doctoral students, Rich Farmer, and that was a book where we each wrote half of the book. Mm -hmm. I had a research leave from UNCG. The book was under contract mm -hmm. and by the American Psychological Association. And then uh, we, um, I had the contract and then to apply for the research lead just said that I'm writing, you know, whatever it was, six of the 12 chapters, mm -hmm. whatever, and then just uh, budgeted my time to write like one chapter a month. Mm -hmm. so. and, and then if we shift to journal editing. Yes. So um, because my specialty was behavioral assessment and in the... Um, late 70s that was a very popular area and various publishers were actually arguing with each other who was going to get to publish the first journal in behavioral assessment so AABT my professional association mm -hmm. actually sponsored the, jour the journal and um, hooked up with um, what's now Guilford Press, Guilford Publications, you've probably seen their name in many places, and um, so it was, um, they were competing for the journal, and then, um, at the, and then I think actually it was ended up being published by uh, Pergamon Press, and um, so, um, and I went to visit these, I was chosen as the founding editor of the of the journal and help negotiate with these different publishing houses and then so I had the journal for I guess it was um, the first three or four years of its existence and mm -hmm. then ha helped pick uh, subsequent editors after that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm trying to see what we didn't talk about about mm -hmm. outdoor outside professional organizations. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing with uh, in these other organizations, in AABT, the name was changed later to ABCT, but it's the same organization. Mm -hmm. um, I was elected the first uh, female president, but again, my thinking at that time was um, it w wasn't like oh there there are people elected me because I was a female. It was I my thinking was just because it was so, I don't know, it's, uh, it was always that way. And so if I had so many publications and I was so active professionally, it would seem it might sound immodest, but of course I would be elected. I deserve to be elected regardless of gender. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I was the first uh, female that was elected as president of ABCT. And then just a few years ago in New York City, they had a symposium at the national convention and it was called like the trailblazers or the uh, women who broke the uh, or who stretched the glass ceiling and so um, of course I was invited as the first female president and then some of the other um, after me there were other female presidents so a couple of them were invited or people who were prominent in research so I think there were six of us on the symposium and it was in a ballroom in a hotel in New York City and it was standing room only it was just packed um, and people we had like specific questions we were answering and then people from the audience asked questions but it was uh, and then we wrote um, into a journal we each wrote a piece um, the things we had said at that symposium, and then it was published as a series in a, in a journal. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we shift to things you're most proud of mm -hmm. during your academic career. Okay, so again, as after um, our two sons, who are now in their 20s, were born, I um, sort of gave up all of the national and international scene. We've traveled since then, but not professionally. Mm -hmm. And then um, I kind of settled into uh, being at UNCG and especially just staying within the psychology department. I never really was interested in like becoming a dean or 
um, a university administrator or applying for jobs at administrative levels elsewhere. And you know, during that time, of course, I got job offers from other universities, but I was very content to stay here. Mm -hmm. And then what um, we have, um, various, the clinical program has been awarded various training grants, and they, they provide um, mostly uh, stipends to doctoral students but they offer uh, different sites for the students to do their training. And the goal of these training grants is to increase the number of psychologists who are interested in XYZ. Mm -hmm. And so we had a series of training grants to serve underserved populations. And then we have to demonstrate that indeed uh, a good share of our graduates ended up in locations that serve the underserved. And then the current one we have now is in medical settings. There's a new movement called uh, Integrated Behavioral Health Care, where a patient sees their medical provider, and then the medical provider calls in the psychologist to, because the person's not taking their medication, they're under stress, they're depressed, they've had a traumatic experience. And then the psychologist provides services right on site, mm -hmm. in, uh, they're usually very short appointments, 30 minutes, with a follow-up visits if necessary after that. But it reaches many more people mm -hmm. because more people see their medical providers than they call an independent psychology clinic. Or, gotcha. Yeah, so they, um, it hits more people. So that's our current um, training grant. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then the, the grants also provide money for guest speakers and um, books and supplies if we need them, like in special fields or whatever. And so as part of those training grants, um, my, I guess, favorite locations that I've uh, worked with has been Newcomer School, which is a public school in Guilford County, um, and it's across the street from Western Guilford High School, and it's um, I've had a couple of publications about Newcomer School in my research, at least at that time. It's the only freestanding public school for um, newly arrived immigrant and refugee children. Some places across the country might have a, a wing for uh, immigrant students mm -hmm. or they might have a floor of a building, but this is a school and it um, varies in uh, enrollment. Um, at its heyday, it had as many as 550 students, and now with the um, current bans on, and limitations on immigration and refugee status, we're down to about 270 students. Mm -hmm. It's about half as many. Right. And then uh, we have, through these training grants and now through a contract arrangement with Gopher County Schools, we provide the psychological services for these um, I'll call them children, although it's grades 3 to 12, mm -hmm. and the children have uh, traumas coming to the United States. They have traumas from their own countries, like in Syria with the war going on. Mm -hmm. When they come here, uh, they have problems reuniting with a parent that left them in whatever Honduras mm -hmm. you know 10 years ago they don't even know this person who's mm -hmm. telling them what to do and how to live mm -hmm. so there's like reunification issues um, and then of course the children especially from Central Africa have you know had their parents maybe both parents killed or kidnapped and seen death and war um, since the day they were born so um, the need for services is great and the uh, the school is great. I mean, it's like the world should be. There's people that at any one time, last time, there were 30, 34 different languages there, but everybody's there for the same purpose, to get an education mm -hmm. and to learn English and learn about the United States. And then another place that we had a, uh, could provide services was uh, Elon Law School has a um, placement called the uh, Elon Immigration Humanitarian Law Clinic and they do like the screening of individuals and they recommended to our clinic 
um, that we don't we think this person deserves to be a U.S. citizen. You know, they did the background checks and so on, mm -hmm. but they are. We don't think that they can take the citizenship exam. You have to know um, U.S. history, U.S. civics. You have to be able to read, write, and speak English. So we did um, probably 50 of these citizenship evaluations. And I just made up a test battery because there's really no such thing in the literature. And so we used a nonverbal IQ test and copying forms, which you would have to do if you were learning to write any language. And then we would write a report. And then these were people, some of them had been in the US for a long time, people that were 80, 90 years old mm -hmm. that um, never went to school in Vietnam or wherever they were from. They don't know how to read, write, or sp any language, let alone a new language at their age and so on. And people who were brain damaged from war torture from um, that were cognitively impaired because of that. But the best thing is that um, the reports that we got that 100% of the people we recommended, the immigration judges approved that they be exempt from the citizenship exam. Oh, wow. Because they were very, you know, our assessments were very thorough and mm. documented. There was only one person that Elon referred that we thought could take the exam, so we didn't recommend the that they be uh, exempt, right. but that was very interesting too, meeting people from all over the world mm -hmm. and uh, people who were pretty um, low functioning compared to what was required for the exam, mm -hmm. but very eye-opening to see the variety of people in this country to say the least. Definitely. And then we have the UNCG Psychology Clinic, which operates as a community clinic. And so one of my main jobs is um, working in the clinic as a supervisor. Um, and at any one time, I have uh, four doctoral students who are supervisees, and they each have their own uh, caseload. So that's, um, and I like doing that. And then I have, as I mentioned, undergraduate honors um, theses that I'm chairing. I work with um, the off the undergraduate, um, the Office of Undergraduate Research and Creativity, and they only allow two students to be funded per faculty member at any one time. Mm -hmm. So usually I have two students who are funded through um, the ERCA awards and chair their um, honors thesis and. Um, they're good students because they're Hunter students. And then um, I supervise the research. I've had a um, very good fortune of having been able to admit uh, many doctoral students over the years. And I just counted and I graduated my 70th doctoral student on Thursday at oh, the Hooding. So, congratulations. Yeah, so it was, um, but all of that is, um, like one-to-one -one teaching, mm -hmm. so it's a, as opposed, I mean, I do teach my graduate seminars, but mm -hmm. more of it is one-to-one, -one. and then the question in terms of being proud of the accomplishments is because, you know, all of these people then go out into their own careers mm -hmm. and then um, continue to be productive professionals, and it's just like, um, you know, the uh, spreading the profession basically right. through other people. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we're shifting to changes in UNCG over time. Uh -huh. okay. um, so uh, the main change is obviously the UNCG has grown in size uh, and rap very rapidly in right. terms of the number of students. Mm -hmm. And um, so even though there are now online classes, uh, I think most students, at least during some of their time, they prefer to take or they must take some on classes on campus. And so um, there's been a pretty rapid proliferation of academic buildings, mm -hmm. the dormitories. Um, I think parking remains a problem. Sure. Uh, but there's just... Uh, the growth of the campus and going across, uh, you know, Lee Street or High Point Road, Gate City Boulevard, um, in increases the space for the campus. So that's been very notable. 
Um, I think the campus remains uh, physically attractive. The, uh, there was a groundskeeper, a head maintenance groundskeeper named Charles Bell that when he retired I thought the whole place is going to uh, disintegrate because he had designed beautiful flower beds and he had an article in the Greensboro News and Record every Saturday on gardening tips and he knew what he was doing but uh, was glad to say that the <laughs> campus remained um, physically attractive. Mm -hmm. And then I think the main change that has happened everywhere is the uh, changes in technology. Mm -hmm. Again, when, when I first came, we didn't have computers, desktop computers, and so everything, paperwork, all had to be typed, and we had a fleet of secretaries whose job really was to type things if you didn't type things yourselves and especially typing on forms mm -hmm. where you'd have to keep adjusting where the lines were. We had the secretaries do complicated typing like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, the same thing with like um, references and this was true for the students as well. You had to go to the library and um, the journals actually find a physical journal and take notes from it. There were copy machines, but you, you, know, you couldn't copy every single thing that you wanted to know about. So people spent hours like taking handwritten notes from um, especially journals, because the books you could check out, but not the journals. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, the increase in convenience um, in terms of you know being able anywhere to be able to call up a journal article and, and in any convenient location because the Jackson Library obviously has subscriptions to all these electronic subscriptions and then with all the word processing capabilities of computers you know people can send tests or when you're writing a manuscript or editing a manuscript it's so easy to, to do that or editing students papers, it's just, uh, it's made life, academic life, just so much easier and so much more um, efficient. But then on the other hand, there's so many more things being written, it's almost impossible to keep up with mm -hmm. your own, even your own little tiny field, right. because there's just so much, you know, being published because it's so much easier to analyze data and publish articles. Um, than, than it used to be. And then um, I remember on campus when the uh, cell phone technology just started, it was a Blackberry was the brand, uh, and I remember the um, uh, chancellor and provost saying, I'm sick and tired of waiting for deans to return my calls, and so they issued Blackberries at that point just to all the deans so they could be in in constant contact, mm -hmm. and then, um, of course, the technology now has uh, you know, changed much more rapidly. I, w I had my first one was an iPhone 3, so I was one of the first mm -hmm. faculty that just purchased an iPhone, but that's because I had you know, teenage sons that knew about the technology right. ahead you had of an time <laughs> and kept me up to date with it, too, so it was... Um, it was good. Uh, tell me how UNCG has affected your life and what it means to you. Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned, I um, chose UNCG based on the collegiality at my initial job interview, and that has not changed. I think I um, still feel um, very positive about my colleagues and workplace, and so I've been satisfied. Um, I think in looking back, I probably could have done more in terms of getting big research grants, but that wasn't like mandatory and I could run my research without them. So um, that's probably the only like omission in my uh, professional career. Um, and I have influenced a lot of people through my teaching, both classroom teaching and the one-on-one -on -one work that I've done. And uh, so I feel you know, very satisfied with uh, my career. I could have you know, taken jobs elsewhere, as I mentioned, but um, chose to stay in my 
niche here, and um, I think it's worked out well for me. I think so, too. And so these interviews are for the 125th anniversary right. of the campus, mm -hmm. which is an excellent time for reflection, but also helps us think about where we're going to be in the future. So what do you think is the future for UNCG? Where do you see UNCG going as an institution in the next 25 to 50 years? Mm -hmm. Well, I hope it, I guess, doesn't change too much, because <laughs> I think it's a, a good uh, combination of what it is now. It's called a Research two institution which makes, uh, I think, a good balance. I have been on the Promotion and Tenure Committee <coughs> through the College of Arts and Sciences, and the uh, uh, faculty are evaluated not only on research and publications, but on uh, their teaching, both the amount of teaching they do and on student ratings and peer evaluations of their teaching. And I think that's um, good for the students having faculty in the classroom as opposed to only teaching assistants. Mm -hmm. So it's a good balance between teaching and research. But the research is also um, supported. People can get a research leave and they can um, there's a lot of help on campus to get external funding, people that will help write grants, evaluate grants, and so on. So I think that's um, a good balance. Um, I see the student body continuing to grow the, as the population grows and the expectation that college is more normative. Um, again, when um, I was growing up, going to college was something only some people did. It was considered um, more unusual than it is now, and I think still only maybe fewer than half of the U.S. population has a college degree. I think it's it's in maybe at the most 40 percent, but more it's the expectation mm -hmm. that people will at least try to go to college. Not everybody succeeds, not everybody can afford to, but the expectation is. And so, um, and there's not room at the flagship universities anywhere to have continuing to grow the number of students that they have. And so the other um, university system is going to have to absorb more and more of the students and the community college system as well. As well. And so um, not only are there greater numbers of students, but the uh, increasing diversity of the students, which is uh, much needed and only enriches the lives of everybody around the students as well. So we have um, uh, students of different ethnicities at UNCG's uh, racial composition, and I think we could do better in terms of attracting more international students. There is um, one of my, my university services, I work for the study abroad program mm -hmm. and interview UNCG students who want to go abroad, but I don't really see the reciprocity. We mm -hmm. could have more students coming from other countries mm -hmm. than, um, than it seems apparent, at least to me. Uh, but I think the growth and diversity, both in students and hopefully in the growth in faculty, diverse faculty is lagging far behind, although I know many departments are also pushing for diverse faculty as well, including the psychology department. So I see you know, those kind of uh, changes, but I, I, again, I hope UNCG retains its um, Current flavor of being, a, you know, a balance between research and teaching, and the um, maintaining its um, the students' first posture. I love the students' first uh, office. I think there was a great idea where, and I hope that's um, it, it is a motto. But I hope it continues to be a motto mm -hmm. where the UNCG doesn't change too much, even though it's bigger. All right. I don't have any other questions for you. Do you have anything else you wish we had talked about? Um, no, not really. Okay. All right. Then we're, we're done. Thank okay. you so much.